Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Manassas National Battlefield Park in Virginia protects one of the defining battlefields of the Civil War. It was there that the first battle of the war was waged in 1861, and it was the scene of a second battle a year later. And it was where Confederate General Thomas Jonathan Jackson got his Stonewall nickname. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. Despite the significance of Manassas, the Prince William County Supervisors in December agreed to rezone 2,100 acres adjacent to the battlefield to allow for the development of the world's largest data processing center. A lawsuit recently was filed in a bid to stop that development. Among the plaintiffs is the American Battlefield Trust, a nonprofit organization that works to protect American battlefields dating from the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. David Duncan is president of that organization. He joins us today to explain why the Trust thinks it is wrong to build the data processing center next to Manassas National Battlefield Park. We'll be back in a minute with Mr. Duncan. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. Gear up for 2024 with Interior Federal Credit Union. Synchronize all your accounts in one place with their tool, Money Management. Money Management allows you to create budgets to fit your lifestyle, set up goals for the future, monitor your account and loan balances with one login, track debt, and more. Apply for membership at interiorfcu.org and sign up for digital banking to get started. Federally insured by NCUA. Welcome to The Traveler, David. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Kurt. I appreciate the invitation. You know, um, the American Battlefield Trust has done great work across the national park system, beyond the national park system, for all the the Civil War sites that uh, are not included in the park system. But today I want to focus on Manassas National Battlefield there in Virginia. And um, it's quite a a history-rich unit of the national park system and a history-rich unit when you're looking at Civil War battlefields. What, What can you tell us about Manassas that really makes it stand out? Well, uh, I think one of the the main things about Manassas that truly makes it unique is that it is the site of two major Civil War battles. And there are only a couple of places in the country that uh, have that distinction. You know, some of the battlefields around Richmond, such as Gaines Mill and Cold Harbor, uh, the National Battlefield Park down there uh, overlap. But uh, nothing really comes to the extent of Manassas uh, with the the two big battles, the first one in uh, the first major land battle of the war in July of 1861, and then the much larger uh, battle in 1862 that many people believe was a precursor to the Antietam campaign. Uh, as well. So uh, the other thing from a preservation standpoint is Manassas can legitimately be considered one of the birthplaces of the modern battlefield preservation movement, uh, because on some property very near the land that we're going to be talking about a little bit later on today, Congress uh, decades ago had to do a very expensive Uh, purchase of land and decided that was a pretty poor way to save battlefield land. And so a uh, secretary of the interior back there then named Manuel Lujan uh, set in motion an organization that was a precursor, a predecessor uh, to the organization that we are today. So in many ways, many of the 58,000 acres from all across the country, 25 states, 155 battlefields, uh, and now three wars, the Revolutionary War, 1812, and the Civil War, uh, have their genesis very near the Manassas battlefield. Yeah, yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, as you mentioned, you know, there were two battles at Manassas, and that, that first one in 1861, if my memory serves correctly, people kind of looked at it as an event, 
I mean, they came out from Washington to watch these two armies meet, and they really didn't think that the Civil War was going to amount to much of anything. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, uh, almost to the extent that it, it was, a, a um, as you say, an event, uh, you know, much like people would go to the Super Bowl uh, now or, or any other big contest. There are reports of people coming out in their carriages with picnic lunches uh, and things like that. Uh, again, no one had ever experienced a war on this continent to this scale before. And the thought was, sure, it'll be a little set piece battle uh, and then everybody will go home and maybe we'll shake hands and, and resolve these uh, issues in some other fashion. But uh, as we all know, it turned out to be far different from that, not only on that afternoon uh, in which a lot of those illusions were shattered, but over the next four years where it became the most destructive war in our country's history. Right, right. And then uh, the second Manassas, um, wasn't that one of the bloodiest, if not the bloodiest campaign? Uh, it was certainly one of the bloodiest. Uh, I think Gettysburg still eclipses it. Um, but it it was uh, kind of right in the middle of uh, just a, a terrible season of fighting, which started uh, down on the peninsula, uh, up around Richmond in earlier 1862, uh, moved to a place like uh, Cedar Mountain uh, before it uh, hit Manassas uh, in August of 1862. And again, then uh, kept rolling, kept rolling northward. Uh, Lee was emboldened by his victory at 2nd Manassas to move on and invade the north for the first time, uh, which resulted in the Antietam campaign. Uh, and, of course, Antietam still remains the bloodiest single day in American history, bar none. Uh, more than D-Day, more than 9-11, uh, still more Americans perished on that day than any other. Yeah, that's just incredible. Now, now let's, let's back up just a little bit. What, what role does American Battlefield Trust play? I mean, it, it's simple to say that, you know, you guys are to Civil War battlefields is what National Parks Conservation Association is to national parks. You guys are a rather large organization in terms of fundraising and, and the money that you put back into preservation of Civil War sites. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, we are primarily a land preservation and history education organization. Um, and while we do a certain level of advocacy, uh, as we're talking about today here at the Manassas Park, uh, our, our primary mission is to identify endangered, unprotected battlefield land uh, from the revolution up through the Civil War, work with willing sellers. You know, we're not interested in taking anybody's property. We pay fair market value from willing sellers and to the extent possible, bring in matching funds from federal, state and local sources to help pay that fair market value to landowners uh, so that we can buy their land. And then whenever possible, uh, we try to get that land into a park, be it the national park nearby or a state park or a local park even, uh, or we even hold on to property. We currently own and manage something like 13,000 of the 58,000 acres we have saved. And so land preservation is job one. Uh, and then over the years, too, we've increased how much education we're doing because we've had to. Uh, we've just seen um, a, a decline, if you will, in uh, history education. Uh, I've been with the organization almost 24 years, and I can tell you it's real. Uh, I've seen it for sure. Uh, so we've had to put more and more of our members' resources uh, into education as well. But we have about 45,000 members all around the world, mostly in the United States. Uh, for pound for pound, they are the most generous and supportive nonprofit uh, members and supporters that, that uh, I've ever seen associated with any other organization. I've had close conversations with other nonprofits who, who would trade their membership base for hours in a heartbeat. They are so dedicated uh, and so passionate about this mission. Um, and we try to be good stewards of their support every single day. Yeah, it really is interesting. Um, my my oldest brother, um, he, he passed away a couple of years ago, but he lived in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. And um, whenever I'd go to, to meet him, we, we'd go out onto the battlefield there and different sites. And he toured me all over the place. And you go into his house and they had, you know, beautiful artworks depicting, you know, the Civil War. 
era and whatnot. And it really is amazing the passion that is built up behind the Civil War. And we, we don't necessarily have to get into the motives of that passion, but suffice to say that there's great interest in the Civil War. Now, your organization also, I don't know if it's recently, I've noticed it recently, you've shown an interest in Revolutionary War sites. Uh, we have. Uh, and again, that was the result of a, a couple of uh, requests back several years ago, um, primarily one from the National Park Service. And in that, um, one of the, the key programs we use to help preserve land at the time was only available uh, for Civil War battlefields. But uh, to kind of broaden the interest and the reach of that program, the Park Service came to us and said, well, you guys are the best in the world at saving battlefield land. Would you consider expanding your mission? And when your biggest and most important partner in your mission asks you to consider something, you do it. Uh, <laughs> and we did uh, and you know, really looked at it. And we surveyed our members and the general public about, you know, is, was this a good thing to do? Uh, and it's turned out to be one of the, the best things we could have done. Um, now, we're still predominantly a Civil War battlefield preservation organization because there's more Civil War battlefield land to save. But we have a goal of attempting to save 2,500 acres of Revolutionary War battlefield land for the nation's 250th anniversary coming up. And we're well on our way to doing that, especially in a place like South Carolina, where much of the battlefield land is still pristine. It has not been developed, like, uh, say, outside of Boston, uh, and is still relatively affordable. Uh, so we're we're making great inroads on the Revolutionary War. And I, th I think it's a perfectly natural extension for what we're doing. We are right. the American Battlefield Land Preservation Organization. Right, right. Um, going back to Manassas, one other thing um, I, I jotted down. That's where Stonewall Jackson got his nickname, Stonewall. Uh, at first Manassas, he absolutely did. Um, yeah, a little bit of controversy over that. Uh, it was a, another general, uh, as the Confederates were having a rough afternoon there, um, you know, uh, he, he made a comment along the lines of rally, you know, there stands Jackson like a stone wall, rally on the Virginians. And that sounds, you know, like uh, Jackson was being very stout and, and sturdy. Some have interpreted it to mean that, you know, Jackson was just standing there when he should have been moving. But um, I, th I think the second part of that, you know, rally on the Virginians indicates that it was, if it was said at all, and it may be apocryphal, but it's a great story. Um, I think it indicates that, uh, Stonewall Jackson was doing what he should have been doing there at the time. Yeah, and of course, if you visit Manassas today, you, you can't help but um, gaze up at that statue of uh, General Jackson on his horse, looking like a Stonewall. <laughs> well, uh, he looks a little more like Arnold Schwarzenegger, if you ask me. <laughs> um, and it, you know, when I was a younger person and went there, I was, I did. I, I looked at that statue and thought, wow, you know, he looks like Superman. Uh, it wasn't until much later in life when I did a little more research and found out that, you know, Stonewall. Uh, or Thomas Jonathan Jackson at that time was probably about 5'10 and 175 pounds. Uh, so not a whole lot bigger than I was at that time. I've put on a few more pounds since then. But um, yeah, it, it is very much an idealized statue. And I think as long as people realize that, um, I'd say his horse was on steroids as well, too. <laughs> looks like. We're talking today with David Duncan, the president of the American Battlefield Trust, about Manassas National Battlefields and uh, some recent threats that are on its doorstep, literally. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. National Parks Traveler has launched the National Parks RVing Guide, the definitive guide for RVers seeking information on campgrounds in the National Park System. The guide is now available free through the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. If you're a traveler who wants to explore the National Park System, you'll want this app. The guide is packed with details for campgrounds in more than 70 national parks across the country, searchable by park, state, or region. You'll also find feeds of the traveler's content, including our latest stories and podcasts. Download the National Parks RVing Guide and start planning your next trip today. Listener and reader support make the National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation at nationalparkstraveler.org. 
Okay, we're back with David Duncan, the president of American Battlefield Trust. Um, David, a, a recent threat has come up at Manassas National Battlefield in the, in the form of a, a digital processing center. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, Kurt, um, it is a, um, a threat called the uh, Prince William Digital Gateway Complex. And before I get into it, um, what I like to say at this juncture of the narrative to anybody who's listening to me is I want to stress that the American Battlefield Trust is not blanket anti-development. Uh, we're we're not anti-data center, even though it's going to sound like it through the rest of this podcast. Uh, we're not anti-warehouse distribution centers or housing developments. Uh, we just believe that those types of development can be done sensitively and in a way that protects America's irreplaceable historic resources, such as are represented by a place like the Manassas National Battlefield Park. So I always want to stress that we're not knee-jerk, reactionary, anti-development people. We know people need places to live and work and shop. Uh, we have a website with over 3,000 pages of content, so we know we need servers, computer servers out there. We have a YouTube channel we want people to tune into. So we're fully embracing the digital age. But again, there are places where these things can be cited so that they do not negatively impact the power of place that is uniquely represented by a, a battlefield uh, in our uh, view. So in Prince William, immediately on the western edge of the Manassas battlefield, uh, there is a proposal that passed at the end of last year uh, that would allow a rezoning, actually three rezonings crammed together, that uh, for any of your listeners who aren't sitting down, I would recommend that you do so. Um, Again, data centers are massive buildings, usually windowless, anywhere from 60 to 100 feet tall, um, so the, the height of a 6 to a 10-story building, and inside are just rows and rows and floors and floors of um, computer servers, and they run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they process information. At Manassas, this proposal that the Prince William County Board of Supervisors greenlighted at the end of last year for a rezoning that would allow this would be the largest data center complex on planet Earth. I'll say that again. It's the largest one envisioned uh, on planet Earth. And that's saying something because in nearby Loudoun County, Virginia, there are already more than 200 data centers. Uh, Prince William County already has 100 within the, the confines of the county. This would build another 37 of those mammoth buildings, uh, again, each up to 100 feet tall. Um, I've been told the total square footage of this development, um, anywhere from you know 1,000 to 4,000 feet from the western edge of the Manassas battlefield, uh, it would be a footprint three times the size of Disneyland or four times the size of the Pentagon. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the, the scope and scale of these things. Um, they have been, uh, for the last two or three years, really ever since the pandemic, just uh, popping up everywhere in the Commonwealth of Virginia. There's some unique characteristics that make uh, the Commonwealth uh, a magnet for these things. But yeah, um, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, the it, it has to do with uh, you know cabling, undersea cabling. It has to do with the availability of water resources in terms of rivers, uh, and uh, just uh, the land use policies that are in place in the Commonwealth. So it's been kind of the wild west when it comes to data centers in the Commonwealth. The statistic that blew me away that I, I read in Virginia Business Magazine last year was that seventy percent of the entire world's internet traffic goes through a six square mile area of nearby Loudoun County, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that's not a national security issue, but um, so this, this one again would dwarf anything that has ever been envisioned by the mind of man previously. Um, so the, the data centers again run 24 seven, because of the heat generated from the computer servers, 
if you fly over them in and out of Dulles Airport, for example, you can very easily tell which ones are the data centers because their rooftops are covered with air conditioning compressors uh, because these things have to be kept cool. And I'm told, again, by people a lot smarter than me that with the advent of artificial intelligence, uh, they work faster, uh, they work hotter, and so the air conditioning requirements have to be powered up even more. And in some cases, they have to be cooled by water. So now you have to pump water through them uh, as well, too. So enormous power drains, resource drains, people who live nearby complain about the constant noise from the 24-7, dozens, uh, scores of uh, air conditioning compressors on the roofs. And, and again, the, the numbers that uh, we've heard is that for example, for this build out for the 37 data center acres covering 1700 mile, uh, 1700 acres, excuse me, which is a third of the entire uh, Manassas National Battlefield Park. It's about 5,100 acres. So this development is a third of the size of the existing park. Uh, you, you've got to build at least 12 power substations. They would consume roughly three gigawatts of energy, which is the equivalent to the power used by 750,000 new homes, which is more than five times the number of households currently uh, in Prince William County. So I, I'm trying, I hopefully am and, uh, and conveying the sense of the scale uh, of this massive development that is, you know, in our opinion, being shoehorned uh, into an area that is not appropriate for it. Well, why is it not appropriate? I mean, um, every day, you know, it, development happens out there. Um, not too many years ago, um, there was concern about um, uh, allowing gas and oil wells to be built next to a national park like Dinosaur National Monument or, or Capitol Reef, uh, Canyonlands National Park. And so you begin to wonder, do you need a buffer around a buffer around a buffer to protect these places? Oh, sure. Well, uh, going back to the, the struggle that we have mounted in Prince William County, and we've been working on this for close to three years now, um, it goes back to basically local land use decisions. Yes, as you say, I mean, they, that's exactly what these are. And Prince William County had in its comprehensive plan uh areas set aside for these types of developments uh you know data technology areas uh essentially but uh, a couple of years ago the first part of this was they not to get too arcane here but they went through a process to create a comprehensive plan amendment so they wanted to amend their own comprehensive plan to change permissible uses uh, in a part of the county that was previously designated something called the Rural Crescent, uh, and that's this land uh, near Manassas. And immediately to the west of this proposed development is a, uh, a state forest uh, as well. So you've got a very small, relatively small strip of land between a national park and a state forest, very rural in nature. Um, and they, they decided they were going to amend their own county comprehensive plan to, to build this behemoth development there. Um, that decision back in 2022 landed Manassas on another group's uh, most endangered historic sites list for Preservation Virginia. Right. Uh, put, that, uh, put the Manassas area on this for this particular reason. Um, and then after an all night hearing and there've been several of those in Prince William they're getting they may hold the record for those things now back in November 22 they passed the board of supervisors passed this this comp plan amendment so didn't mean they the land was going to be rezoned it just meant that it could be and we are a an actual landowner in that area we own land that our members have helped us buy and save that we have not yet uh, turned over to the park uh, that's immediately adjacent to uh, this development. And so we we had a vested interest uh, in trying to keep this down. But So right now the, the land is rural, rural character. Um, has the, the, the county board of supervisors given any rationale for this decision? Is it just a 
we need more tax revenues. Is it? Uh, is there a money trail to follow out there? Uh, to to a certain extent, yes. Uh, there, and that's that's one of the reasons why these types of developments are booming uh, in Virginia. Uh, they're not necessarily data centers are not necessarily uh, job creators because you don't need a large workforce to run a data center. You know, basically just somebody to keep the the power running and the lights on and maybe do some troubleshooting here and there. Um, but you know, they are, if they're, they're being funded by some of the best capitalized, uh, companies in the world, household names, uh, if we read them off, you would know who they are, but think about the, the big data using organizations and companies out there in the world, uh, who basically can pay any price, uh, either both in terms of land or uh, taxes as well. I don't know specifically if they're getting favorable tax treatment or not, but um, it's it. I think the thinking among many elected officials is, yes, this is easy money for the county. That's amazing because I know Ken Burns, uh, the documentary filmmaker who, who produced the Civil War as well as uh, National Parks, America's Best Idea, wrote to the county supervisors, I believe. I believe the, the county's own historian recommended against this project, and yet nothing seemed to impede the decision-making process greatly. No, it didn't. Um, and it wasn't even just Ken Burns, God bless him, uh, and the county historian. Uh, and I think this is key, that this past autumn, the county's own professional planning staff, the people that they pay to help make help them make these types of decisions, uh, all recommended that these rezonings be denied. Uh, they said there was simply too little detail being provided to them by the developers uh, to to go ahead and greenlight these things. And the finding that finding was also echoed by the appointed members of the the planning commission. Uh, which there was also an all-night uh, public comment meeting on that as well. Um, and and even literally until the last minute, the uh, developers kept amending their own plans. Uh, again, I've been told a final revision to the uh, proposal was submitted to the board as the final board of supervisors meeting was underway. Now, there's also a key component here is that board of supervisors that made the decision to green light this proposal and move forward with it uh, was a lame duck board. Many of them lost their election uh, based on this issue. And our good friends at the National Parks Conservation Association did some polling in May of last year and uh, not surprisingly found that you know, kind of what you were saying just a minute ago, uh, Kurt, that 86% of Northern Virginia residents, and by the way, that's pretty much equal across party lines, wanted to prohibit data centers within one mile of a national park or other important historic site. Just one mile. We're not asking for five miles or 10 miles, um, but it, you know, gives some protection to these irreplaceable resources. And then the same poll by NPCA, uh, you know, really pointing at, you know, they were going to, this was going to be a priority at the polls. 96% said they would support elected officials who take a strong stand in protecting these sites from data centers. And that was borne out in 2023 during the primary season in which many of these pro data center candidates, including the chair of the board of supervisors lost their seats. So, uh, there must be enough sentiment left for the, the, the current board of supervisors to approve the rezoning. Well, that's that's one of the things we're asking them to take a very, very hard look at. Uh, and um, you know, we believe that um, you know, there was such a rush to do this in December uh, that the, this was something the lame duck board really wanted to get done. So they, they rushed it through and... Um, uh, believe me, I would much rather spend our members' money buying land or uh, putting out education programs than paying for lawsuits. But uh, we've we've joined the lawsuit with the local group uh, out there. You know, David, we talked about the the land that is being rezoned and its rural character. 
it also has some historical character, no? I mean, um, I, I've seen some mention that, you know, it possibly could have been added to the national battlefield because of the significance of that land. Well, absolutely, uh, Kurt. And it's, there are a couple of distinctions. And again, I want to don't want to get too esoteric here, but um, the National Park Service itself, when it is uh, back in 1993, there was a commission put together by Congress simply because there were so many threats uh, against battlefields. And um, they wanted to get a handle uh, on uh, what, where exactly the most important hallowed ground was. And this commission that contained people like Ken Burns or the great uh, historian emeritus who passed away a couple of years ago, Ed Bars, uh, who was on Ken Burns' series, the great you know, foghorn voice of Ed Bars, uh, and many other experts, you know, they d- identified the 374 most important determinative battles of the war. And for each one of those battles, they delineated a core area, which is where the central area of most of the shooting, fighting, and dying was done. But they also did something called a study area, which encompassed hospital sites and avenues of approach and staging areas for the battle and things like that. This particular area on the very western edge played a prominent role during the Battle of Second Manassas. Uh, This was the area very close to where General James Longstreet's Confederate Corps uh, arrived at you know the the perfect moment during the battle to slam into the Union left flank and roll them up and really finish off the battle. It's not far from uh, where the previous day Stonewall Jackson held on by his fingernails along a railroad cut, an unfinished railroad cut. That um, after a while, after so many repeated Union assaults. Uh, his his men ran out of ammunition and resorted to throwing rocks. Uh, so it's a famous uh, episode there called the Rock Fight. We own uh, again about 170 acres at the western edge, right up against this where this development would go. That was once called the Rock Hill Farm, and it was an area that has been long known to be uh, a site of a field hospital. And so is likely, very likely, to contain soldier burials to this day. Uh, And I think that's a key thing about any battlefield, is we think that so many of the soldiers were disinterred and moved to national cemeteries, and many of them were, no question about it. But in my mind, there's absolutely no doubt that there are still soldier burials at these battlefields that were unmarked at the time of the battle, you know, very often where if if you were shot and killed uh, right here, they dug a hole next to you and roll you, you into it. And that was that was it or a mass grave somewhere. So, um, uh, yes, the developers will say, well, everything else happened over on the National Park. But we know it's it's never so tidy. Yeah. Have there ever been any archaeological studies to, to pinpoint some of these burial sites? Um, I'm sure there have been, Kurt, but I don't know right off the top of my head, uh, yeah. especially in this area. Uh, again, it takes takes money to do some of those things. but um, And in some places, in some of the battlefields, uh, the, people actually went back and did kind of extensive maps um, where there were known um, burials. There's one in Antietam, certainly one at Gettysburg as well. But uh, there may be one for Manassas, but I'm not I'm not aware of it. So where are we today? Is this a, a done deal, or um, is the Virginia congressional delegation interested in, in taking a look at this? Have they expressed an interest in this? What what, what can be done? Well, uh, a couple of things. First is it's not a done deal, uh, and I want to stress that. Uh, we recently joined a suit filed by nine private citizens who are also in the immediate proximity to the rezone land. And this group is kind of gathered under the auspices of the Coalition to Protect Prince William County. Um, they are represented uh, by Attorney Chap Peterson, who uh, is a uh, Fairfax County lawyer, uh, an attorney who has just completed actually 16 years very successfully as a member of the Virginia State Senate. Uh, Chap has been a great friend to preservation uh, all across the Commonwealth for many, many years. 
We've also got another law firm uh, in, out of Richmond, which has extensive land use experience in the Commonwealth. They're also representing us in our legal action uh, around another development about 40 miles away at the Wilderness Battlefield in Orange County. Uh, so again, I'd much rather be spending money buying land and uh, and putting uh, out YouTube videos on these conflicts. But unfortunately, this is what we have to do right now. Uh, I will say that I think for the first time in the Virginia General Assembly uh, right now, there is interest in taking a look at data centers uh, as a whole, uh, just because there's there's concern primarily about how much energy they're going to require in future years, but also for these types of issues that are important to us in terms of have, have we gone too far too fast and uh, we're in danger of losing irreparable parts of uh, the state's history uh, and and even other states as well, too. I tell people that from basically Petersburg, Virginia to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and that entire corridor, and now moving westward into the Shenandoah Valley, moving into Tennessee, North Carolina, uh, North Georgia, and other places, uh, it's coming. And we see it coming uh, to some of these other uh, areas as well, too. So this is not an issue that's going away anytime soon. So um, I, I think there is renewed interest in, first of all, just making sure that there's someone looking at, at how many of these things are being created and developed and built. And then also, hopefully, that they're going to take uh, into account the important historical resources that are near these. Uh, again, just you know, from from a, a you know, person who is passionate about this, I've dedicated almost 24 years of my life to this subject of battlefield preservation. It is so hard to grasp and feel the power of the place uh, if you're surrounded by development. Um, and if it's a you know a, a ten story uh, monolithic data center with constantly whirring uh, air conditioning compressors on top of it, increased traffic, um, and and other things like that, it just it so diminishes the resource that quite candidly we believe we need to be a better country and to educate future students, young and old about what it took to create and define this country. Uh, I think we need that more than ever. So we need places like Manassas and we need them to be in a state so that people can go there and have meaningful experiences. Right, right. Now it's been a while since I've been to Manassas. <clears throat> I'm trying to um, envision where this might be. There's that stone house that is just, uh, I believe, outside the park. Uh, actually, Plain. that's still it. If the, the famous stone house is just down the hill from the main visitor center, that is right. absolutely within the park. And that's actually pretty still far east uh, in, in the park. So you've still got to go a couple of miles west uh, out. Uh, the stone house was was much more a part of the first battle, which is kind of the eastern half of the battlefield. And then the second battle of Manassas uh, extends considerably further west. Yeah, obviously, I got to make a trip back to Virginia. To there you go. Ref Come on back. Yeah. Refresh my memory. I'm planning it. I'm planning it. My, my sister in law. Well, you can, any, anybody asking. can Google Earth the Manassas battlefield. And what you'll see is uh, a vast sea of green, uh, pretty much these days, utterly surrounded by rampant development. Um, you know, Interstate 66 runs along the southern boundary of it. There's, there's, uh, shopping malls, there's a community college nearby, there's housing developments, all of it is just crushing in from every side. Um, the western part had been heretofore thought to be pretty safe. Uh, and now if you, you know, again, we're, we're talking about the largest data center development on planet Earth on the western end of the battlefield, uh, it's, it's just going to cause irreparable damage to the what that battlefield is. As far as the lawsuit, um, I didn't get to look at the whole whole filing, but I, I believe it, it it makes some allegations that the the board of supervisors kind of jumped the gun and, and circumvented some regulations and, and steps that they should have taken. 
Yes, uh, exactly, Kurt. Um, yeah, we're we believe there were several substantive violations, uh, and that's why we're asking for the rezonings to be overturned by the new board. Uh, these violations include, um, you know, everything from a lack of required information about the development specific details. We think a lot of that was kind of swept under the rug. Uh, inadequate public notice uh, and hearings. Um, unlawful waivers of some key analysis submissions and approvals. Again, you know, they went against their own planning staff uh, recommendations. Um, we think there was a failure to consider key environmental and historical facts uh, having to do with the property. And then, um, you know, this is kind of legal ease, but uh, unlawful delegation of rezoning power uh, through failure to identify which areas of the rezoning could be put to what uses. So, uh, you know, just a, a lot of things that uh, should have been done better, uh, in our opinion, uh, and which are serious enough to merit this particular rezoning being overturned uh, and then re-examined again. So uh, the next step is that the county and the developers have a very specific time window in which they must um, or they get to issue a response to our filing. Um, but I would stress to your listeners, you know, this is a very, very complex process and it will probably move slowly. This isn't a you know a crime drama on TV that's going to be resolved in an hour. Um, so, you know, as an example of that, uh, we filed uh, a lawsuit in Orange County for the Wilderness Battlefield last May, and that suit is still in the discovery process. Uh, wow. So, um, these things can take an inordinately period, a long period of time. The good news is is they're not going to be building anything while this goes on. But if people would like to learn more about this, um, we've got some information on our website. So they could go to www.battlefields.org slash digital gateway, all one word, battlefields.org slash digital gateway. That's great. That's David uh, Duncan, the president of the American Battlefield Trust um, discussion today about a Digital Processing Center proposed to go in next door to Manassas National Battlefield. David, it sounds like uh, a long, slow slog, and it'll be uh, interesting to watch how this proceeds, and uh, hopefully you'll get the desired result. Well, thank you, Kurt. Um, again, we've got uh, the wonderful support of generous members all across the country and around the world, even. Um you know, it's not just a Virginia issue. It's not just a Manassas issue. It's not just a Northern Virginia issue. Our members care about this country, and uh, they they have signed up to support our vision, our purpose of inspiring people to appreciate this country, its history, uh, and the sacrifices that were made to give us the great country that we have today. So uh, this battlefield is just part of that. Uh, and they, again, they believe passionately that places like this need to be saved, preserved, protected, and then passed along to the next generation. Um, and if we do that, then we've done our duty. And uh, again, they're they're very generously supporting not only the purchasing and preservation of these properties, but uh, also helping us fund these fights. But um, we sh we still could use more help. There's no question about that. Yeah, and I'm sure if people go to their website, they'll be able to figure out how to help you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, um, battlefields.org/stopthethreats. Uh, we'll give you a little bit more information on that. So uh, battlefields.org digital gateway or battlefields.org stop the threats. And again, we've got over 3000 pages of content, including, you know, probably a couple of hundred pages on the two Manassas battles. So if you want to go read up on those, please feel free. Uh, yeah, it's a great resource, David. I, I must admit I've Thank used you. it in the past. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, we'll be watching from afar and uh, we'll, we'll check in when need be to, to get an update on this. So thanks again for joining us, David. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. That's our show for this week. We hope you found it interesting. Here at The Traveler, we'll continue to follow the lawsuit and whether it is successful. Next week, 
my guest will be Dr. Veronica Jovovich, a conservation scientist from Panthera, the global wildcat conservation organization. We'll be discussing mountain lions from California to Florida. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.